Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks for taking the time out of your day to join us on these pig webinars. Unfortunately, um, Gosia was um, supposed to be doing the introductions and uh, running the meeting, but she's got uh, audio problems. Uh, just to let you know, if you could all kindly continue to keep your microphones muted and your videos off, that will help with the background noise and the, and the bandwidth issues. Uh, the topic today is, is, is the second one really in the, the series that, that has been motivated by the Southeastern branch of the Pipeline Industries Guild, it's a very active branch. And um, this one has been written by myself and uh, Projects Director at Coral Consult, Richard Lindley. The previous two projects uh, that we presented were the Beginner's Guide to Cathodic Protection, and we'll have to make some reference to that to give you the background to what we're going to talk about today. And the other one was a bit more off the wall, really, about how solar farms affect pipelines, but we, we won't be saying much about that today. The, uh, you can send the questions in at any time via the chat. But uh, I must say, when I'm presenting, I don't normally have much time to look at the chat, so I'll rely upon Kate to uh, or Gossia to to look at the chat. But at the end of the presentation, uh, we were going to have a panel of a pipeline pipeline expert, a coatings expert, and myself. But uh, we were unable to coordinate everybody, so there will be a coatings expert present. That's uh, Luc Perrard from Decotech, a, a guild member. He'll be available to answer any questions that come up on coatings, and I'll be there myself to answer any questions on stray current and cathodic protection generally. So you will be able to get a, a download of this, and it will be posted on YouTube. So if you miss anything, you'll have a chance to go over it and uh, to catch up. So I just want to make clear what you won't get out of this presentation. You won't be able to do any stray current corrosion protection designs and you won't understand all of the science and engineering behind uh, stray current corrosion but what you will have is is a a good understanding of of what the issue is and why it worries us and uh, i think that's a very good start if anybody wants to take it any further you can contact me or the guild and we'll be able to um, to assist you in any way that we can some interesting stuff really corrosion although it only accounts usually for about on a cross-country pipeline it's about one percent of the overall cost of the project but globally it, it's worth it costs the world two and a half trillion dollars every year and Astonishingly, they, they think about 80% of that could be avoided by using existing technology and techniques. So it, it's a bit of a, a pity to waste so much money. So in order to lead you through stray currents and their impacts, which I just need to remind you about the things we covered in the CP Beginners course, which basically is all common sense, but it, it's good to keep it in the back of your mind when you're even thinking of complicated issues. Steel isn't stable. It's something that we make ourselves and we add lots of energy to it to make it. And as soon as you leave it alone, it, it goes back to being what it was. And the speed that that happens depends on the sort of environment it's in or how easy it is for it to corrode. If you stick it in sulfuric acid, it'll, it'll go a lot faster than if you bury it in concrete. And the other thing to remember, and this will come up again and again, is that wherever current leaves the steel and goes into the soil or, or the electrolyte, whether it's uh, soil, concrete, sand, water, wherever the current leaves, there'll be a metal loss. And, and the metal loss is directly related. There's a linear relationship between the metal loss and the magnitude of the current. So to stop that natural corrosion process occurring, we, we do two things. The first thing is to create a high resistance between the steel and the soil, because we know from 
the laws of electricity, principally Ohm's law, that um, if you can put a big resistance in the way of a current, it, it will reduce the effects. So that's what we do with the coating. And then where there are slight coating damages, uh, either with time or whether it's construction damage, we apply cathodic protection, which essentially forces current onto the steel and prevents the current from leaving the steel. So if there's no coating defect, or if the cathodic protection is effective, there won't be any coating, uh, any corrosion damage. So now we're going to have a look and see what, a little bit more detail about what constitutes a, a protection system. And again, this is just a, a recapitulation of what we discussed in the beginner's guide. But the corrosion protection system is actually everything that is concerned with the, the pipe. It, it concerns the storage and handling, how you transport it, how you install it, what tests you do before you bury it, how you do your repairs, how you coat the joints in the field that you make, and how you should be paying special attention to areas of high risk. And it, it can be that stray current corrosion is one of those high risks where you want to pay special attention. And this is just a reminder about the, the role of coatings, what, what they do. And it's easy to forget how important coatings are when you're thinking of stray current. A lot of people make this mistake. They think it's an electrical problem, so you, there's an electrical solution. But very often for, for some of these applications, if it's a simple, uh, short exposure area. Modern day coatings are so good that you can in fact put a high quality coating on that's defect free. Uh, it's always been the mantra that there's no such thing as a defect free coating. And that is true if you're talking about extended lengths, but for short lengths where money isn't the issue, then you can consider applying a really high quality coating combined with really stringent tests after you've installed it and with some monitoring. So it's, a, it's an area that shouldn't be ignored if you've got say a simple crossing and you've only got about 10 meters of pipe that's at risk and you can't apply cathodic protection, then this is, um, this is what you need to be looking at. And the modern day coatings are applied so well and so efficiently we're not relying on a, a bit of PVC with a bit of chewing gum on the back and uh, wrapping it by hand uh, without any machines to assist with the tensioning. So it's a, it's a really viable option. The, the risks of stray current and corrosion are covered in a number of different standards. The cathodic protection standard 15589-1 that's also a British standard, by the way, that covers cathodic protection, which is basically what we would call a static application of, of current. It doesn't vary up and down straight line. Railway information is covered in the, the 50122 series, which are not normally read or, or used by corrosion people, but there are three in that series. One, tells you how to provide decent earthing and separation distances. One tells you what to do to avoid generating too many stray currents. And the other one tells you what to do when you have an interface between direct current and alternating current, which I'll talk about a bit later on. And for stray current conditions, there's a new standard published in 2021 in March this year. ISO 21857, and that specifically deals with stray currents and pipelines. It's the very first one ever written on the subject for pipelines. So now, now we know what a cathodic protection is, and now we know what coatings do. What's stray current, and why do we have it anyway? Well, in simple terms, it's, it's current that returns to its source via routes other than the intended route. That's a direct 
more or less a direct uh, quotation from the international definition of stray currents. And you'll perhaps recall that for an electrical circuit to work, it has to be complete. If you have a, um, a flashlight, a bulb, say, and a battery, and you connect it up, it, it will only light up when you have all the wires connected. If you switch it off, if you break the connection, the lamp won't work. So when we come to look at the railway in a bit more detail, you'll see that if any current jumps off the railway line and doesn't go back home as it should, when it gets into the ground, it doesn't care where it goes. It, it'll, well, if there are any pedants listening who are scientists, they'll, they'll disagree. But you can consider that the current takes the easiest path. And usually a pipe resistance is very low. So if there's a coating defect on the pipe, the current will see that, jump on the pipe. And if there's a, if Murphy's law kicks in and you've got a defect on the pipe close to the substation where the current originated from, it will jump off the pipe there and go back home. So it's really important that um, you don't allow that current to get on the pipe because once it's on, it's got to get off. The scientists will tell you that the current doesn't actually just take the easiest path. It, it actually takes every single path that's available to it. But some of those paths are such high resistance that they don't really make any practical difference. So the problem isn't where it gets on, it's where it gets off. So as you can imagine, there's just these two scenarios, it gets on and it gets off. Where it leaves the pipe, if it leaves the pipe via the soil, then you would lose 9.1 kilos of steel per amp per year. That's from Faraday's law, and it's pretty well applicable in this case. The, the biggest culprit, sorry about the rather amateurish uh, drawing, the, the biggest culprit are the railways, DC railways, direct current railways, things in this country like um, the London Underground, uh, some, some main lines, um, some tram systems, metro systems and so on. And if we take the analogy of the battery and the torch, uh, the battery is where the power comes from, which here is represented by the substation and the light on the torch which is represented here by the train, that's the load. So what happens is the train draws current from this substation. It goes into the train and inside the train is a motor. It goes through the motor, out through the wheels and back on the rail and back home. So if you break that circuit anywhere, the train will stop. If you break that rail there, the train will stop. If that pantograph breaks, that will stop. Uh, in the in the UK, we tend not to use that on our underground system. That connection is actually a rail on the ground. And if you're ever standing on the London Underground and you look down, you'll see two rails and another rail beside it, which is standing up on insulators. Well, that's this wire here. And instead of having that little pantograph up there, we have a little shoe here, which goes down to pick up that return current. But we put this rail on very special sleepers to keep it isolated from the ground. And the intention is that all the current goes back through the rail, but inevitably some current leaks off. And in the standard, we did write and advise people that you can expect 2.5 thousandths of an amp, 2.5 milliamps per meter to, to leave the, the rail and go into the soil. So here you can see it coming into the soil going through the system and then going back home. Now, when we measure cathodic protection, we're looking at pretty much straight lines. Here's a, a recent graph taken in February this year, showing the pipe to soil potential of your pipe here, going from minus 25 volts up to just over plus 15 volts. And these little wiggly bits here is when the the, the train wasn't operating. These are the night times where the train system is shut down. 
and these are the days where it's working. So you can see there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven days worth of data there, which is equivalent to about 300,000 lines of um, data that, that has to be analyzed. But if you were looking at normal cathodic protection, it would be a straight line like this. So when we write the standards for cathodic protection, we tell people what potentials to achieve. And just to take some figures as, as approximate examples, we would take minus one, which is about here, as being the kind of potential that you expect to see. So you can imagine if you're expecting minus one and you get minus 20, there's a great deal of panic goes on because if you take a pipeline too negative, you can start to evolve hydrogen from it and you can change its mechanical properties. And this has been the, the these potentials like this have been the cause of a great deal of concern over the years. And a lot of it has been unnecessary and has been, uh, it's been fueled by people who don't really know what they're talking about, frightening clients, because we have to look at an averaging, not, not just a, an instantaneous uh, potential, but I'll come onto that a little bit later. So what you want is a straight line and what you've got is this, this wiggly mess. Now, the railways aren't the only people who can cause uh, stray current problems. Sun also causes um, quite serious stray current problems on long buried pipelines by inducing voltages into the pipeline caused by the changing magnetic field. Uh, the, these are generally referred to as space weather events. So it's, uh, it's true to say that some pipelines are affected by events that go on in space. And another source of stray current is um, when we're laying pipes in energy corridors where you can see the, the pylons here running at very, very high voltages can induce voltages into the pipes during the construction period and even after it's buried, uh, the, um, the pipe doesn't really see much um, at all. Uh, it doesn't see much protection at all from the soil. It still gets affected by these voltages. And we'll be talking about that a little bit later and how we can mitigate that. So here are some common sources, AC and DC railways. The AC railways operate at about 25 kV normally in most of Europe at about 50 cycles a second. Well, not about, at 50 cycles per second or 50 Hertz in this country and one third of 50 hertz, which is 16 and two thirds hertz in many other countries. DC railways operate, operate at all kinds of voltages, but 750 volts is quite a common number. And you've got your tram systems, trolleybus systems under some circumstances, large scale welding operations, if they're not properly earthed for the return to the welding system, metro systems, and you can get a static interference from adjacent cathodic protection systems. But what's not so obvious is that you can also get uh, significant interference from tidal effects. Uh, there's a quite a well-known effect up in Northern Scotland uh, where the, the tide rushing through some narrow areas induces fluctuating potentials onto the, onto the pipe. You can get it from industrial size solar power systems because of the way they convert the the solar power into um, mains power you can get it from wind farms uh, the high voltage power lines even if they're buried although we can mitigate that a little bit if they bury the cables in what's called a trefoil formation where you instead of laying the three cables side by side you you drape them over each other so they cancel each other out in, in a certain way. And an increasing number of high voltage DC cables now around the world where people are sharing power with high voltage DC. So it's, uh, there's more than you think going on out there. That's a, a typical uh, large scale solar power system where there are quite a few documented cases of that. 
And we do deal with all of those systems in the ISO standard. We've given examples of them and shown examples how to calculate uh, what's going on and what you need to be doing. Now, as you can see from those rapidly varying fluctuations that we do need to have some method of being able to analyze and evaluate the corrosion risk when those things are changing so quickly. And it's uh, difficult to find something analogous, but I, I thought it might be easier to understand if you could think of, say, a very light, a very fine rain. And uh, if that only comes for a short period, you don't get too wet. But if you have a, a heavy rain shower that lasts for quite a long time, you, you do get wet. So the the way that we do the calculation and the way that we show it in the standard is that we look at only those peaks that are going to affect the corrosion and then we average them and then we see what the longest continuous period is when it's outside the limits. So if you get a, a very big swing like that 25 volts we saw, but it only lasts a second, that doesn't really cause us any problems because there's a kind of inertia in the corrosion process, especially if the, the steel is cathodically protected. So it doesn't corrode straight away as soon as the potential goes very positive or very negative. It, it, it takes some time to get going. And if that goes away quickly enough, then we don't have a problem. So we, we do, we do have a method to calculate it now and to prove that you haven't got a problem. Uh, the, there are many things that drive the corrosion rate on a buried pipe or a coating defect, but really the key, the key driver is the current density. How much current there is per unit surface area on the pipe. So if you get one amp on a one centimeter square coating defect, it's more serious than if you get one amp on a one meter square coating defect, because you've got all of your corrosion taking place in the, in the, in the one area. So what are the best options to, to stop the stray currents? That's got to be the question. It's always better to try and mitigate a problem at source rather than on the victim. And there are some things we can do that not so easy, of course, if it's uh, the sun that's causing you a problem, but it, it is marginally easier with some other operators. You can perhaps um, at least go reason with them, particularly now that we have a, a standard that um, explains it more clearly and gives them every option to, to follow it through. So what do we do if we, we we can't mitigate it. What do we do if there's so much interference and we don't know whether we're Arthur or Martha by the time you've looked at the values? So the first thing to do is to really see if you are at risk. And to do that, you need to do some data logging or some continuous monitoring to measure the time averaged interference values. By that, we mean you take a value which is acceptable to you. So if it was a cathodically protected pipeline, just to keep the numbers easy, you might say, well, I don't want anything more positive than minus one. So you will analyze the data and you will extract all of those values that are more positive than minus one, anything from minus 0.9 up to wherever. And then you will analyze those individual bursts of interference to see how long they last whether it's one second, two seconds, 250 seconds. And then you can see where your risks are and you can perform a calculation. It's known as the Q factor. Uh, I didn't put it in here because it's a bit of a laborious calculation, but at the end, it tells you whether or not you're at risk. And more often than not, in the modern scenarios, you're probably not at risk because of the the high quality of the coatings, uh, the infrequent number of coating defects, and the fact that constant monitoring now is much easier than it ever was. 
So what do you do if you get a level that you can't live with? Well, the first thing is to uh, have a look at the pipe. You can do above ground surveys and determine whether there are any coating defects there. And if it's in a location where it's going to be relatively straightforward to expose the pipe and repair the coating, then you could apply um, a high quality coating. And when I say a high quality coating, I mean something with good long-term properties, not something that's going to be all right till it gets wet. You need something that's going to last you 30 or 40 years uh, if, if it's related to stray current and even longer perhaps if it's railway related. <coughs> you, um, you can always, of course, reroute the pipe or change the pipe to being plastic. That's a very expensive option. And over recent years, I've seen many instances where people have said, oh, we had to change the pipe because uh, somebody came along and measured the voltages and they were so high, we had to change the pipe. Well, more often than not, it wasn't necessary. But the pipe owners often don't mind because they get the railway or the contractor to pay for the, the rerouting. But the reality is it, it's not always necessary. And a lot of people have a lot of faith in mathematical modeling. And it's not often well placed to have such faith in the mathematical modeling because most of them don't provide dynamic potential profiles, which means you can't do that maximum period of exposure calculation. The reason is because they're so expensive and so time consuming to do uh, with um, even with fast computers. So you need to be careful with people who just drop mathematical modeling plots on your table. There are some fantastic companies doing absolutely superb modeling. And there are quite a few that you wouldn't send to Sainsbury's with a shopping list because they have no idea. And it's usually because the modeling people are contacted by a cathodic protection company who say, oh, can you do modeling? They say, yeah, we can do modeling. So could you model this? Yeah, we can model that. And the cathodic protection guys, no idea what the mathematical modeling guys are doing. And the modeling guys, unless they're specialized in railways, probably haven't got much idea of what the railways are doing. In the old days, we used to do it by a, a different kind of modeling, which was very, um, very pedestrian. It was very slow and it's very difficult to do with complex um, circumstances. But you just need to be aware of not putting too much faith in mathematical models that haven't been proven. Right, uh, just to remind you again about cathodic protection um, and, and also to draw your attention to the PIG presentation from Chris Atkins of PIG, who, who did um, a presentation, it must be more than a year ago now, uh, but uh, that, that's a very useful introduction. But what you should remember is that cathodic protection generally, it, it, there are no hard and fast rules, but generally speaking, people tend to work on saying minus 1.2 is the most negative I want to go to because after that there are in some kinds of some types of steel there is a risk of hydrogen evolution and, and pipe degradation and you wouldn't want to go much more negative than about minus 0.85 of a volt so there's not too much difference between those two values. So you've got quite a narrow band for cathodic protection. And the potential of steel without any cathodic protection on which we call it its natural potential is about half a volt. So even between that and protection, there's only half a volt difference. So it's not a, um, not a big range you've got to play with. So I've already had a whinge about the mathematical modeling. The, the standards are very clear in that they, they do have to be time averaged. Now, here's the paradox. The old fashioned cast and ductile iron pipes with really disgraceful quality coatings on them 
shameful, really. I don't know how the water industry's got away with it for so long. But they have because the, because the coating is so poor, the current density is relatively low. And because they're generally not electrically continuous because of the way that they're connected together, they actually are a good option in stray current areas because there's no inducement for the DC voltage to jump onto a cast or a ductile ion pipe because it, it's not going anywhere. So the most it might do is just jump on and then travel, let's say 10 meters, uh, but that's all. So it, it's really, it's really wrong to say that cast and ductile iron pipes are at great risk from stray current corrosion control in the vicinity of um, electrified railways. It's not true to say that they're never susceptible. They have to be checked, but nevertheless, you shouldn't panic and have a knee jerk reaction. And I think what you should say is that if you are concerned about it, you need to be monitoring it at the very least and uh, doing something about it. But as a first step, you should realize that cast and ductile iron pipes have to be treated differently in stray current areas than continuous lengths of steel pipe. And with the modern electronics, it's uh, relatively straightforward to get protection. Uh, this is a, a photograph of a modern cathodic protection power supply that's replaced the old transformer rectifiers that you see those old oil cooled and air cooled things up on poles. This reports in every second with the data and puts it into the cloud into a database and it can be programmed to operate in what we call potential static mode. So if you don't want the potential going up and down like a fiddler's elbow, you tell it what potential you want, let's say uh, minus one volt, and then it will automatically, seamlessly switch its current output up and down to meet that requirement. So it varies the cathodic protection in order to meet the interference levels. In that way, you can get a perfectly stable um, potential and you can remotely control the entire system, switch it on, switch it off, change the levels uh, that you want for protection, stop it recording and all, all that sort of stuff. And another thing that's available to us now that, that wasn't uh, a long time ago, well, say maybe 10 years ago, are electrical resistance probes, which are devices that take away any of the uncertainty about evaluating the fluctuating potentials because it just measures the corrosion rate on a special probe, which is placed close to the pipe. And this is an example of a solar powered one in a, an area where there was no mains available to provide power to it. And that also sends the data up to the, uh, to the cloud and you can look at it and you can see whether or not you, you've got a problem. <laughs> right, now we're gonna deal with AC, which is a completely different endeavor really. It's, um, it's a lot more complicated to understand and I've, I'll try to make it um, understandable to you really, that there are two, two issues with AC and pipelines. One is the corrosion risk, which is dealt with an ISO 18086 and 50443. And the criteria aren't the same as for cathodic protection because there's more than one criterion and you have to treat them in different ways, which we'll talk a little bit about. The third bullet point here though, is the one that's more problematical generally, and that's the unacceptable touch potentials, which can be induced on the pipelines during construction and during operation. And that uh, health and safety issue always takes priority over stray current always, 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 because it's, it's a safety issue. And the criterion that is becoming now more adopted is one of 15 volts. And there's a little bit of controversy about that because within Europe, we still have value, values of 50 and 60 volts as acceptable 
up, up to the acceptable limit, but uh, it's now trying standardized on 15 volts and it's uh, probably not a bad thing. Just to remind you, we did touch on this in the beginner's guide to AC that electromagnetic waves, as you can imagine, comprise two components. You've got a magnetic field here, which is at running at right angles to the potential or the current field here, the electric field. These, although they're shown separate here, they're inseparable. So you, you can't have one without the other. If, if you're running a DC current through a cable, you will get an electromagnetic field, but it will be constant. It won't be fluctuating. And what we know from AC voltages and conductors is that they will always induce a voltage in a conductor. If you put a conductor, a bit of steel, a bit of copper, into a varying magnetic field, then it will induce a voltage. That's how generators work. The bigger the magnetic field, the bigger the voltage, all other things staying the same. And of course, the bigger the magnetic field means the higher the current. So in the UK, we've got um, quite a wide variety of overhead high voltage lines ranging from about 5 kV to to about 600 kV and there's some even more than that. Generally speaking, we don't get problems until we get to about 10 kV. Now, although you can generate these voltages on the pipe and they might be less than dangerous, they might be below the 15 volts, it can still give you an involuntary reaction and the injuries that have been recorded on the sites that I've worked on and, and the, the records I've seen vary from somebody stepping off a scaffold platform because he gets a, a shock and injuring himself as he falls or somebody falling in a ditch or somebody stepping back into a busy main road because he's got an electric shock. It's an involuntary reaction. And there was even a case of um, a poor young apprentice standing behind an electrician watching carefully what he was doing. The fellow got an electric shock, pulled his hand away and poked the screwdriver into the poor apprentice. So as you could say there's even a risk of being stabbed. So it's not to be taken lightly and there are many things we can do about it. But one of the things we can't do, of course, is to move the electric cables away. Now, it is a problem during construction when you've got lots of bare pipe hanging around, which is easy for people to touch. And of course, the, the ways you can mitigate it is you can earth each uh, pipe section, just take a copper rod, uh, hit it into the earth uh, reasonably deep, a meter and a half maybe, and then um, connect between the pipe and the, and the earth rod. You have to do a few calculations beforehand because it depends on the resistivity of the soil and so on. But generally, that, that's what we do. And we issue special handling gloves to the, the working crews that um, are insulated sufficiently to prevent them getting electric shocks. And if there's a problem around, say, um, a valve, then they can build an earth mat, which is just a lots and lots of uh, rods buried in the ground which mean that when you stand on them they're all at the same potential so you don't get an electric shock you only get an electric shock if, if there's a difference between um, the voltage you touch with one hand and the voltage you touch with the other hand corrosion likelihood in ac is uh, established in 18086 and it's mainly related to, first of all, getting the target voltage to being less than 15 volts. That may or may not do the trick, uh, but in combination, you have to reduce the current density on the coating defect to a certain level. And you also have to reduce the DC current density to a certain level. And the DC current density is what gives you your cathodic protection. So you can only go so far in decreasing that before you start to increase the risk of corrosion under for normal uh, means. 
So you have to jiggle around with the two current densities. And uh, there is a third current density, which we, we won't go into just now, but it, just to illustrate that it's not, uh, not straightforward. So just to come back to how we mitigate the AC interference in terms of corrosion, basically we earth the pipe. And by earthing the pipe, it means when the AC does jump on it, it's gonna jump off again because the resistance to earth will be lower than the resistance to, to the pipe. You make it so, you, you put special anodes in, usually something like the zinc ribbon is laid alongside, but you can use other things. So unfortunately, the bad news about that is you spend a fortune with your coating and your cathodic protection to make it separate from the earth, but now you're connecting it to the earth so you have to connect it to the earth via a special widget, which offers a high resistance to your cathodic protection current. So your cathodic protection current stays on the pipe and a low resistance or impedance as we call it for AC to the AC voltage. So when the AC voltage get there, it shoots off down the, down the earth. And that, that's all well and good, but some of these widgets uh, are not as good as others. So you need to choose your widget carefully so it doesn't put a load on the DC circuit itself. We're nearly finished, stay with it. Uh, this is uh, just an example of one site we were on and you can see all of the power lines up here. Uh, in fact, there are, there are three, you can only see two of them. There's one lot there, there's another lot behind, and there's another lot over here and they were all very high. And the people were getting tremendous electrical shocks so of this three or 400 volts. So um, we had to put some mitigation in and carefully designed the, the system for them. And they came back and said, we're still getting electric shocks. You haven't designed it properly. And we said, well, you're supposed to put this in about a meter and a half. And they only put it in uh, a few centimeters. So once we got them to hammer it in, that was sufficient to take the voltage uh, off the pipes and they, they didn't get any more electric shocks. So basically the conclusions are that it, you're best to mitigate the stray currents at source. And in this country we do use, uh, and in many other parts of the world, we use the 50122 series, which are also an, an international electrical commission standard, an IEC standard. And we've got 21857 for pipelines. But it, the mitigation normally requires a combination of coating, earthing, and cathodic protection. Well, it's been a bit of a, a rush through. I hope it hasn't been too fast for you. I hope it's given you some insight into, uh, into what we need. Oh, sorry. And uh, this page just really gives you the links if you need them for some things that might be useful for you. Uh, the, uh, the French and the German uh, groups have a long history of dealing with uh, stray current and have got a lot of uh, very good experience which has been translated into some of the standards. Uh, the Institute of Corrosion can help if you want to follow a career in, um, in corrosion. And that is it. So I think uh, what I can do is I can have a look at the chat now and see if there are any questions. I can help you, can help oh, you. can you? Hopefully my microphone is working now. Um, ah, yes, we can hit. Welcome back. So thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. Um, uh, very interesting. And then like you've explained it in a way that it is it is a uh, simply laid out so um, fantastic i've got a couple of questions we've got a couple of minutes so um question number one how important is pipe continuity most water pipes are cast or ductilion with rubber joints do these joints reduce continuity to any great extent and localize corrosion well that's a very good question um I did make some uh, remark about it. Uh, generally speaking, they do form a, an electrical resistance barrier, which prevents the application of cathodic protection, unless you do it on a, a length by length. 
but it also reduces the risk of um, induced voltages from AC because one of the factors you need when you calculate the induced AC voltage is the length. So if the length is short, the induced voltage is likely to be low. And for stray currents, because of the high resistance in the joints, it's not an attractive path for the DC to, to flow. But you can't use that as a universal panacea to say, oh, we don't need to do anything because we've got castle ductile iron pipes. Because over the years, these seals do leak. And, and some of them do have an intermittent connection. And it may be that under some circumstances, you might have a problem. But it's, a, it's a very easy for a cathodic protection specialist to check that for you. He can tell you how the continuity is and if you're at risk. Good question, though. OK, thank you. Um, another question. Um, in a polyethylene pipeline, would this principle apply to any metallic components such as valves or metallic joint sets? Highly unlikely because it, it's not going to be an attractive path home for the current. So if you've got a mechanical, um, a metallic valve in a plastic pipe, it's not likely to be affected by stray current. It might be affected by induced voltages from AC if you're at the extreme end of the high voltage range of the AC uh, overhead cables, but unlikely. Okay, thank you. Um, another question. Does the recently published ISO 21857 provide guidance on the minimum separation criteria for impressed current CP system relative to pipelines? And if yes, what approach is used to determine these distances? This would be particularly important in congested areas. Right, well, good question. Within the stray current one, uh, from adjacent cathodic protection systems is very simple. There are existing formula that tell you how to calculate the potential gradient between different points. And you can apply that calculation to see where your pipeline falls. Uh, it's not a difficult calculation, it's in the, the textbook. I believe it is not in the, the 21857, we didn't, we didn't give any example of how to calculate separation distance, but it is in the standard for the cathodic protection of complex structures, the number of which just escapes me at the moment. But if you'd like, if the, whoever asked that question, if you'd like to give um, Gossia your email address, I'll email you with the standard that's got the formula in. Yep. So uh, that's the questions. If you've got any more questions um, to Ken, please um, send them uh, either directly to Ken or to myself. Um, thank you very much. That was a very good presentation. Um, uh, so um, that was the second one from the corrosion uh, protection series. There is another one, which is on 22nd of June, and the title is High Speed Railway Systems and Buried Pipelines. So please look out. It's going to be um, posted on PIG events website very shortly. Um, and then also I would like to thank uh, Kate and Catherine for organizing this event. Uh, and yeah, please have a look at PIG's website. There are lots of events, not only from the Southeast branch, but uh, from all the other branches. We will be keep going with webinars post lockdown because they prove to be very, very popular. So, uh, yeah, thank you very much for joining and send any other questions or comments. Please, we are welcoming your comments. Um, and, and yeah, thanks again. And thank you for joining and hopefully uh, see you soon. Yes, thank you very much, everybody, for listening and uh, spending your time. I hope it's been of any of some help. Don't hesitate to send us any any queries or if you've got any suggestions for any further toppings, you send um, topics. You could send those to to Gossier. And I, I see we've got a couple more comments uh, 
come in, Garcia. Do you want to deal with those? Uh, they are comments. Um, people are saying the presentation was very good. <laughs> Thank oh, you okay. very much for informative oh. presentation. Thank you very much for great presentation. So yeah, people just appreciate uh, making comments in the comment oh, box. But, yeah. I, I wasn't reading them. I, I just get a little flashing light to say they've come on. Yes, and thanks uh, to Kate and Catherine as well. And uh, I kept on time this time, Kate. I hope you appreciate good that. Good job. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye, everybody. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye.